My name is Michael Kenlin. I'm an education outreach specialist with Georgia Public Broadcasting's Education Division. With me answering your questions is Tracy Wiley. She is my northern counterpart for education outreach. Any of, hi Tracy, any of, uh, any of your questions you can ask in the Q&A panel. And Tracy made a good point yesterday in our webinar of reminding me that um, we can't see you and we can't hear you, but we can see your questions and your names when you ask questions. So I'd like to welcome you to this exploration that we're going to do of the latest virtual learning journey that GPB Education has put out, um, which we call Slavery and Freedom, which is an investigation into the Owens, Thomas House and Slave Quarters in downtown Savannah. So we're gonna look at um, the project that we built and then hopefully you'll be able to go back and navigate it yourself. And your agenda has all sorts of great links. The simple link is just gpb.org forward slash OT and that will take you to our website. If you're familiar with Nearpod, you can go to nearpod.com and you'll see at the top left, the code VRWCX, and you'll actually be able to follow me um, as my screen changes, or you can just watch and kind of follow along here. If you're interested in doing this mobile, if you have students, if you have um, museum participants, uh, you can do this on iOS or Android, so it works for tablets, it works for phones. We have a free GPB app, and you can download that there. If uh, you don't get the QR code, you can just go to your app store, be it uh, Google Play or iTunes, um, and download our app there. And once you download the experience, you won't need internet unless you're watching a video. And there are very few videos in this experience. So essentially, you'll have an internet-free exploration. So it's kind of on the go. You can take it wherever you want. Your agenda should be attached to your registration. That has my information. That also has Tracy's information. If you wanna know more about both of us, you have links to our bios. Those also have our Twitter handles if you wanna follow us on Twitter. You can send us emails if you have any questions, follow-ups. Um, and then you'll have links to all of the resources that are tethered to this experience. So the general website, plus the actual site itself, the Owens Thomas House through Telfair Museum. Some of the um, supplemental materials that we're a very big fan of, Teaching Hard History, which I'll talk about later. And then some of the support materials that we built alongside of this, including some other stuff if you wanna explore more of what we've built. So that's available to you. Everything's live, so you can click on things and have direct links to that content. And when we finish, I'll be sending everyone a recording of this. Plus, you'll get a copy of this presentation. I'll attach the agenda again, just in case you missed it. We'll also be attaching um, the Q&A, so if folks have questions and we find good answers there, we'll give you a transcript of that. I wanted to start with why we felt that this was such an important project. Part of that comes from the Southern Poverty Law Center's study. Um, a couple of years ago that talked about how inadequate our students understanding and maybe even general Americans understanding of the topic of slavery is and why we think it needs to be addressed. And when we were approached by the Owens Thomas Museum or the Owens Thomas uh, House and Slave Quarters, we felt that their approach was so unique, was so progressive that this would be a wonderful opportunity for us to not only showcase some great work, but also to build something that would be free, that we could release to the world, and would be a very useful tool for our students, um, for teachers, and for other professionals as well. Something to note, right? So their approach is a little bit different. Again, that's why we thought this was such a wonderful project. Um, there's a movement that's kind of changing the narrative on house museums and the way we discuss slavery. And we think the Owens Thomas House is at the forefront of this movement. And so they put the enslaved individuals forward 
rather than in the back. So rather than just show the nice rooms um, upstairs and <clears throat> excuse me, in the stately mansion, then um, they showcase the individuals that were enslaved there. And so one of the great things you can see in the actual slave quarters is a wall with many of the names they've recovered of the people that were enslaved on the property as well as surrounding plantations. That said, um, what you'll find is a, a step towards sensitivity, right? And so, words like enslaved will be used rather than slave. Words like escapee or escaped from will be used rather than run away or ran away. And that approach, something we're very happy to be a part of, uh, changes the narrative from someone who was defined by enslavement to a person who was enslaved. And um, that kind of changes the way our students will think about it, but also changes the way participants um, who come to our museums will think about the nature of slavery, something we are excited to be a part of because of their approach. So we kind of want people to know that that's the, uh, that's the language that they'll see throughout the experience and we wanna prepare them for that. Something to note, um, this webinar is part of the National Council on Public Histories conference that is of course now online because it would be going on now. So uh, this is a little unique. We have both, <clears throat> excuse me, we have both uh, museum professionals, but we also have teachers here because of the also unique circumstance that our schools are closed. So up to our museum professionals, other nonprofit professionals, but also teachers. So what we're gonna do is showcase um, both how this is a very, very robust exhibit if you wanted to treat it that way. It's very scholarly, so I'll make sure to point out um, the, on the back end all the acknowledgments, the bibliography and all the research that we did. But it, throughout, you'll also see that there are teaching tools. and We've built a huge amount of support materials on the back end. So what I'll do is I'll show you how to navigate the experience while pointing out some of the teaching tools. And then at the end, hopefully you'll feel comfortable navigating yourself. Then I'll go back and I'll talk about some of the teaching tools that we built into this experience. So we'll have a kind of a twofold purpose here of our webinar. What I wanted to do first though, is show you a little introduction to help you understand um, what exactly we're dealing with. And then I'll break it down for you. So I'll show you a little introductory video that Telfair created that we think is a fantastic introduction. Just about two minutes. For more than four decades, the magnificent Owens Thomas Mansion on Savannah's Oglethorpe Square was home to a succession of wealthy Oh, of course. White families, as well as a varying number of enslaved African Americans who tended to their every need. The day-to-day -day experience of these individuals differed greatly from the plantation slavery portrayed in popular movies and books. The labor of those that worked in homes like the Owens Thomas House was 24-hour labor. Um, they really got much sleep because they had to be on call 24 hours a day. We really have to remember that for enslaved people, being in the house was not pleasant. It was a job. And it was a job constantly under the thumb of the employers. And it all happened here. These roughly finished rooms that hardly changed in the past century and a half represent one of the few intact slave quarters and workspaces in existence in America today. Historians Leslie M. Harris and Dinah Ramey Berry have conducted groundbreaking research into the lives of the slaves who lived and worked in this one-of-a-kind space. We're very lucky to have the Owens Thomas House. It was so well preserved. Um, to have the urban slave quarters is a pretty rare thing. For decades, these historic spaces were overlooked and overshadowed by the ornate rooms upstairs. But that neglect was actually a blessing. 
creating an architectural time capsule that preserved secrets for historians to uncover. The basement of the Owens Thomas House is a unique space, interestingly, because for some years it was neglected. As a result of that, the plasterwork, the floors, the ceilings, they weren't constantly updated and maintained in the way the ones upstairs would have been. That can seem like a bad thing, but in this case, it allows us to have the original plaster, the original stones on the floors that can really uh, give us evidence that helps us answer questions about how people lived and worked in these spaces. So I'll hold it right there. Um, and that goes back to the approach and why this is such a unique space and why we're so excited to be a part of the project and their reinterpretation. Um, also, those two historians built a work called Slavery and Freedom, so we named this experience after that. And much of the research that we did is based on their work. And you can find that in the acknowledgments. I'll point that out in the end. To begin, this is a really, really big virtual experience. Um, it can be rather overwhelming. And so I'm going to start by breaking it down. You'll find this breakdown in your agenda as well near the bottom. I would essentially say that there are three major sections. A lot of people would think that a virtual field trip is essentially a virtual tour, if you will. And yes, that's available, but we built something much bigger. We wanted to you know, take a moonshot at this one. And so what you have is, yes, you can go look at the large mansion and the slave quarters that's on the premises as well. There are 12 different rooms and you can go almost room to room. Some of the rooms we didn't feature, but most of them we did. And we'll look at some of those rooms today. You can also do a literal virtual tour. We brought in a wonderful piece of new technology called a Matterport camera, and we built a three-dimensional tour, and you can walk through the entire house. Um, that's kind of like a separate exploration, and I'll show you where that is. Then you can kind of zoom out. So we have the micro microcosmic view, and then you can zoom all the way out to the macrocosmic view, and get a look at the entire region of Low Country, Georgia, because the people who built and owned the house in Savannah also had property throughout the region. And so we want to make sure that people understand this is not just a disconnected house, it's not just a disconnected house, but it's also connected to a lot of other um, policies and economics. So you can look at an interactive map of the coast. Uh, you can see here a couple of the plantations that George Owens the second or the third owner of the house had. And um, you can go point by point. You can even look into one of the plantations and look at the structure of a plantation economy to see the nature of the economic system. So you zoom into the house, you zoom all the way out to the region, and then we allow you to come back into Savannah and see the influence that slavery had on the antebellum city. And we used an interactive map that the Owens Thomas House provided us, and we built a point-by-point -point exploration. And then we tried to help categorize the different types of groups that were available. Um, we generalized a little bit, wealthy, enslaved, free people of color, what we might call working class whites. And so we can look deeper into the social stratification of the city itself. Throughout the entire experience, you'll see primary source galleries that back up these biographies and these narratives. And we worked really closely with Telfair to make sure that um, not only are these accurate scholarly documents, but they're regionally accurate too. So we, for the most part, if you see photographs, they should be no further than Charleston. Most of them are within a diameter, I think of less than a hundred miles. So very, very accurate in terms of the depiction that you'll find. So. Here we go, I'm gonna launch it for you all and we'll start doing a nice slow interpretation and a navigation. So I'm gonna launch here, if you're on Nearpod, it should launch for you. Before I get started, I wonder if folks have any questions that you can drop in the Q&A, if there are things that you're a little confused about, perhaps uh, my colleague Tracy can answer any questions or she could bring those up to me. I'll just kind of describe the page here. If you have any questions before we launch everything, please feel free to ask them and I can address them before we dive in. So here's our launch page. 
you will click launch and then it'll open the experience. But I wanted to point out that you have a couple other things available to you. If you're on the teaching side, or if you're an, an interpreter, if you do an education for a nonprofit or for a museum, you have a lot of materials available to you. I'm gonna click here in support materials. You have a direct link to this on your agenda. So we know that this is a large experience. So we built an overview for educators that explains the background. Um, it explains this breakdown of the three different regions and you'll see part of this in your agenda. We also know that the language of this era and some of the um, historical language, sometimes historians start to speak their own language as other disciplines do, uh, becomes a little much for the lay person or the student you know, when we talk about things like agency. So we explain some of those terms, but even when you talk about something like a drayman, someone who would have drove a cart, um, we explain that in the vocabulary. We also pull out some great primary documents that we got from um, the Owens Thomas House that they got from the Georgia Historical Society so that you can pull out PDFs. We'll look at some of these later. And we make sure to provide analysis guides for students or participants. And then for each of those three major sections, we have a very detailed lesson plan. So if you want small activities to do, um, point by point throughout the house, this is where you would find those things. Everything from very simple uh, discussions of how you feel in certain rooms to describing the types of people that you might find on the streets of Savannah and analyzing the kinds of laws that were created to keep the structure of enslavement in place. And then if you want to go a little bit deeper, we built some STEAM lessons on the back end that we thought would um, showcase the different types of experiences within. Although nowadays, looking at public health, the uh, yellow fever outbreak in Savannah in the 20s seems a little bit more prescient uh, nowadays than perhaps it was when we built it. So you'll find all of that in your support materials. So we're going to go to launch now. It doesn't look like we have any questions popping up. These 360s we're still building out, and I'll talk more about this later. Every room has a 360 in it. Um, they all will eventually be located here, but if you do want to do just the tour without jumping into the experience, this is the Matterport camera, and eventually, one by one, all of the 360s will pop up here. In the sense, if you didn't want to go into the experience, you could just sort of go through all of these 360s, but they're still being worked on and we're building a VR component for an Oculus headset. So it's not all ready yet, but it is available here in some capacity. And I'll show you where these live inside the experience. All right, so I'm gonna launch. And you come to our big launch page and you'll need to launch one more time and then we're in. We'll start by doing a little bit of some navigation, and then we'll start poking around a little. And I'll play this intro video because I think it kind of helps transport us back to the antebellum era. doesn't seem to like my internet connection at the moment. That's quite all right. And so if I skip, we come to our home navigation page. This is sort of a drone view of the property. And we've landed. So I'll point out a little bit of navigation first and then we can start exploring. There are a lot of buttons and a lot of people get overwhelmed really quickly. So the first thing I'm gonna do is showcase these buttons in the green bar at the top. The information button is pretty critical. It will tell you what everything does. That's your key. And so you'll see like next to garden, you'll see the map point and you'll see that's explained as an access point. So if you wanna know what any buttons do, that's your information button. That said, if I come over to the right, I can explore a timeline to help me understand 
where this house fits in. And so a little bit of background for you, the first owner, the person who commissioned the house, the property was Richard Richardson, um, a slave trader, a broker, a banker, a very wealthy man. And into the 1820s, um, he sells the house, it becomes a boarding house. That is when the Marquis de Lafayette, as you notice there, the Lafayette balcony, Mar the Marquis de Lafayette visited Savannah on a tour of the country. He stayed there at that time. They call that the Maxwell era. And then eventually, uh, George Welshman Owens purchases the property. And the 1830s is really when the house is interpreted. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the 1830s, the 1840s. That's where most of the documents are. And that's what you'll see in terms of the rooms. But you can kind of explore that history here and tie the house into the larger history. All right, other availabilities. A button that you'll see consistently down at the bottom left is the Discover button. And we kind of call this the Discover wheel. If you click there, it'll open all sorts of really cool tools. We tried to make sure that there were places you could go at any time in any way. So there are really three different ways you can move around. The Discover wheel is one of them. Something to notice sort of at the top right section of the Discover wheel, you'll see media, audio, and archives. These are sort of um, extras. So if you're in a room and you open the Discover wheel, you'll notice there are extra documents, extra sounds, and things like that. You'll also notice if we move to the top left, that there's a VR component. It's grayed out because that's not available at the moment, but you will see in rooms, the VR component is there, and that's how we'll be able to look at virtual reality. As you move towards the bottom left side, these are the large sections that I've discussed. So the inhabitants is the city, the economy is the large map of the region, life and labor is also the city. So inhabitants and life and labor are sort of tied together regional economy is separate, and your STEAM lessons are here. So you can always move around those ways through the Discover wheel. I'll close this. If you're showing this experience to some folks, the introductory video that I just showed you, that's available in this intro button. Um, we found that people needed a little bit of an introduction. It's a little longer too, it's about nine minutes. So you can start folks off there so they can feel more comfortable with the background. If someone just wants to explore through that 360 degree Matterport camera, that's the tour button. And some people just want to go off and do their own thing. You can do that here. And that is a different exploration. You literally self guide and walk yourself place by place. And I'll do that in a little while. You can click on any of the orange buttons and that will jump you into these locations. But if you want to move around in a detailed way, my perspective, the designer's perspective, if you look at the top left, just outside your major visual panel, you'll see what we kind of call a hamburger menu in the middle of these three circular buttons. And if I open that, this is your table of contents. It is a detailed list of everything that's available. So your walking tour would be that 360 Matterport. And then remember I said there are three different sections. So you've got the main house and you can see literally floor by floor each room and you can jump to any room you wanna to go to. And then you have the slave quarters, each floor. And that would be sort of section one. You could explore the house. Then remember we said you can zoom out to the coast. Here's your coastal section. And then you can come back in and look at the city. And inside of the city, you can look at the different individuals. You can also look at the legal system and see the difference between urban versus rural slavery. Our STEAM lessons are there. And then for those of you that wanna do some background, um, our research is under acknowledgements. So yes, it's big. I'm gonna start by looking at the house first. So I'll go through these three sections with everyone. We'll start with the house so you feel comfortable moving through it and then we'll zoom out to the region and then we'll come back into the city. So I'm gonna click on number three, main house. Now I'll just kind of remind you because you'll see a lot of buttons popping up and some people get a little anxious when they see all the buttons. So I'll just continue to remind you the buttons should become more familiar and consistent. 
You'll notice it's telling you there are three floors. You can look at any floor you want. You'll also notice at the top right that you can move to different sections of the house. You could move to the front of the house or you could move into the garden. We tried to make it very uh, mobile so you can go into the house or you can move to other parts of the grounds. At the bottom left, you see you can kind of bail out and go on your own tour. There's also a really cool feature. I'm gonna click on plumbing, something that is pretty unique. You can check out the plumbing of the house. It was incredibly progressive for its time. Uh, they had three stories of gravity fed plumbing. A point I'd like to make as this loads, um, we're looking at very, very dense history here. And so when you all are thinking about questions that you have, I would sort of remind you to maybe err on the side of less history. Um, you know, did Richardson do blank in 1819? Was Owens so, you know, uh, holding a certain position in the 1830s? Um, if you have those questions, I'm happy to address them at some point. If uh, I could turn you over to Telfair Museums, or if you want to email me, I'll be happy to address those kind of questions. For the most part, though, the questions I'm probably going to address more are how we can use this as a tool and how we can better understand the navigation. But you've got your um, plumbing page here, just as sort of an add-on. I'm going to hit the back button at the top left to bring us back to our major house page. So you've got your standard buttons. There's one more button that I want to show you at the bottom left, excuse me, at the bottom right, and that's the carousel. So we'll go over this again. You can use your table of contents to move around. We'll have that discover wheel once we go inside the house. You can bail out and do your own tour. And then you'll find a carousel that'll show you room by room or section by section. And so you can jump to different areas that way, seeing the places you wanna go. We tried to make it as versatile as possible. I'm gonna go to the basement and show you what it's like to explore some rooms. So once you land on a room, once you land on a floor, you'll get to see all the different rooms that are available. Rooms are either a deep dive or they're a simple gallery. And so if you're thinking about having a lot of students using it th this at the same time, if you're in a classroom, it might be good to think about the bandwidth you're using because you notice it takes a little bit even for mine to load. So if I had 30 students doing this entire experience, um, it might be even slower. But you'll notice we've got familiar buttons. We can take our tour, we can look at the plumbing, we can look at our carousel. But now I have access points. And so now I can look into these rooms and we'll get a visual. And so some rooms you'll notice say gallery and some rooms say enter. If I want to look into a room more deeply, we'll go to the scullery. I'll click enter. And now we're in that room. You'll see hotspots in the room that'll give you more information. But also now you'll see our discover wheel again. We'll have a summary of the room. So I can at the bottom right click the summary so I can get some background information. And so this, the scullery was used for laundry. Um, a lot of caustic chemicals would have been in here. I can click on my hotspots to know more. But also, if I open my discover wheel, and remember, you'll find your discover wheel in every room. Now I've got more available to me. So I've got audio. I can listen to people boil water. I also have a virtual reality now. Most of the rooms, in fact, every room that allows you an exploration will have virtual reality. And this is a wonderful thing. So if I click VR, hopefully my internet connection will allow it, we can do a virtual reality exploration. And this, is, um, this has voiceover as well. This is really, really cool. And you can look around this it's room. It's located in the basement of the main house and served as the scullery a place for tasks involving water. Enslaved women washed pots and pans, prepped vegetables, and cleaned laundry in this room. 
using information from the 1840 census. Historians think that some or all of the enslaved women aged 10 to 36 likely did the laundry for the Owens family. So you should have one of these for every room that offers an exploration. I'll close that panel and then I'll just click outside of my discovery wheel. Now you notice I can move room to room. I can move by my cellar or my working cistern. I can also move out of this section via my discover panel. So that's the first floor. I'm gonna open my table of contents. And so that was my scullery inside the basement. If I wanna move to another floor, I can move to the first floor and simply jump up. So I'm gonna show you one room per, per floor and then we'll uh, move to the slave quarters and then we'll move out. Something that's really cool to note is we used these from the, uh, the design here comes from the Habs drawings I believe that were done during the New Deal, if I am correct about that. So our designers took some really cool artifacts and then pulled them in um, to the actual makeup. So again, the buttons should become a little bit familiar to you. Your tour, your plumbing, your carousel. Now you have a bunch of rooms you can look in. I'm gonna pop us into the drawing room. Notice you have your enter so I can go in and look around. And so this would have been the room where a lot of guests would have been ushered in right after they had been met by the enslaved butler, Peter. So a point of note here is that if you start reading some of these hotspots, instead of saying something like, um, they would have played harp here, we talk about how some of these uh, some of these luxuries would have been available to the wealthier class, whereas others wouldn't. So we try to um, make the narrative much more inclusive. You'll notice how ornate this room is, which is really, really interesting. The designer of this house um, made sure that this looked like a tent with gathered silk at the corners and even painted the ceiling to look like a sky to dazzle those, he was, those that were being entertained. Uh, those of you in education might note at the bottom right, not, not only do we have our summary, but now we have a writing prompt. That one doesn't want to load for me, that's quite all right. It would load like our summary and it'll ask a question that'll prompt students or, uh, or participants and other users um, to reflect a little bit on the room and the different kinds of experiences that were had here. I'll pop into another room just to show you a little bit more and take you back to the family dining room. Something interesting about this house is there's a formal dining room and there's also a family dining room. So they would have had very, very elaborate dinners prepared by their enslaved cook, Diane, served by the enslaved butler, Peter, but their family dining room would have been sort of like a den for the family. They also would have done education here. Um, the children may have played here. And it's also attached to their butler's pantry where it's believed that the enslaved butler would have slept. So you, you can see a piano from the period, a doll that was recreated from the period. Let's see if our right button will pull up. There we go. So we talk about the difference between the kind of work that Peter, the enslaved butler, may have done versus the work that someone on a plantation may have done. And so these are their entertaining spaces on the second floor. I'm going to open my table of contents back up and I'm going to go up to the top floor where people would have slept. And here you'll see bedrooms, but also a library. And we find out um, a much deeper truth. We get to find out more about the enslaved nursemaid, Emma. Something that's very, very interesting is the documents that were recovered, especially letters, tell us a lot about several people. We know Emma, their enslaved nursemaid, spent much of her life with the family. Even after emancipation, she stayed with the family. 
the enslaved cook Diane, the enslaved butler Peter. We also know about a nursemaid, the enslaved nursemaid Maria, an enslaved maid named Jane. And so we're able to begin telling stories that we wouldn't be able to tell elsewhere. The children's bedroom is where we can hear more about Emma. So you should start to get a little bit more familiar with these rooms, a flat image, hot spots that'll tell you more about specific pieces. The discover wheel is where you'll find your VR and you can start to still tell these stories more deeply. Um, folks may ask why it looks like there's this mat laying on the floor. This is where it would be believed that the enslaved nursemaid would have slept on the floor next to the children that she spent her life tending to. And so we think about how she nurtured these children for her whole life, and then they would grow up to then keep her enslaved. Um, so there's a really, really conflicting narrative here. Something else that's really fascinating, and I'll point this out as we move to another area, is this picture here of Catherine Littlefield Green. Um, it was on her plantation where Eli Whitney patented the cotton gin, and you get to explore that more in another section. I'm gonna to move to the slave quarters because it is one of the most significant examples of urban slavery still available. And you can look upstairs and you can also look downstairs. Upstairs has a little bit more um, available to it in terms of interpretation because uh, a lot of this was plastered over and was rented for a time. And when they uncovered the plaster, what we found were these exposed walls. But also if you look at the ceiling here, the haint, the, the, the cultural practice of painting um, ceilings, a sort of light indigo shade or a periwinkle we might find on Southern porches, that's the paint that they find here. And so we see a direct connection between West African culture and the culture of in, enslaved domestic servants. And you can look at their lives interpreted. You can also look more deeply through a uh, virtual reality in your discovery. And you can see primary documents. So I mentioned to you that if you open your discovery wheel at this right hand portion, you'll see more available. And here you've got archives. So in our archives, we put documents relevant to their experiences. And every room will have some. I can't guarantee you they'll have a lot, but every room will have some. And so we talked about the nature of enslavement, how folks would escape from enslavement and we brought on um, captions and uh, ads from local newspapers that discuss resistance to slavery but we also wanted to show sort of the nature of the time and you would have a sale of someone's furniture right next to the idea that someone had escaped from slavery and we kind of get to put a more human face the descriptions that are available and how people were referred to in this time. So you have a host of primary documents inside of all of the different rooms. Mike? Gonna, yes. I think this is a good time to jump in with an earlier question. You're using a lot of the language that you mentioned of sensitivity and are talking about this right now. And the one of the first questions we had was, have, you had, have we had any school or community pushback to the changes, changes in language, narrative, and challenging persistent memories? That's great. So what we offer in your teacher guides are a discussion of why that change is there. Also, you'll find on your agenda, and it'll be in your teacher guides, links to curriculum that fit that sort of changing narrative. Um, and that is the teaching tolerance, teaching hard history curriculum, where they talk about going back and looking at history a little differently. Have we had pushback? Not yet. Although if I'm very honest, I was at the Georgia Association of Historians conference and there was some discussion from different museums about what do we do if people walking through house museums sort of get frustrated or anxious. Um, I haven't dealt with it personally, but what I do, so I teach at a small college in Brunswick. Um, when I teach my survey students, I just explain why we speak that way and why we think it's a proper narrative and why it's progressing in that direction. Do you think that helps answer the question? 
I do. Thank you. That's perfect. Excellent. And maybe we could um, include links to those resources when you respond in the email directly. Absolutely. So you'll find in your agenda, um, you'll find links to Teaching Hard History, all of their curriculum, also their podcast series. And a wonderful thing to note in their podcast series, the historians you saw in the introductory video also helped write the book, which we base this on. They are in the podcast helping to explain how we can kind of rethink American history. I'm gonna open my table of contents again, and I'm gonna leave the house. So that was sections three through four, but really that was the first big breakdown. And I'm gonna jump us out to the antebellum coast so we can zoom out and then we'll zoom back into the city. So out we go to the map of the coast. George Welshman Owens, the third owner of the house, um, during which time the house is interpreted, 1830s, 1840s, owned at least eight other plantations. And on those, on those plantations, he enslaved hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people. What you can do is explore plantation by plantation, information about each of these different plantations. And we also included a sort of prompt, um, whether it be for students or uh, folks who are walking around, ways to reflect on these different plantations. Now, some of these aren't just plantations. You'll notice Jekyll's a little different. So Jekyll was the site of the wanderer, what is believed to be one of the last. There's debate, Alabama believes they have the last slave ship. Jekyll says they have the last slave ship. Um, you know, historical debate, one of the last slave ships that came into port in 1858 landed in Jekyll, and a lot of those enslaved individuals would have come to plantations like this. You'll also notice Savannah, being the city where Mr. Owens lived, has a lot to tell us, and then we can go back into Savannah, but also Mulberry Grove has a different point. Mulberry Grove is the site where Catherine Littlefield Green hosted the tutor, Eli Whitney, and you have a gallery and you can go deeper into the history of his work on the cotton gin and its effect on slavery. So we tried to build a comprehensive approach to understanding slavery and its connection to Georgia history. So you have a patent, an actual letter where he's licensing. You'll even notice this is really, really interesting. Here's his signature, here's her signature, and the state of Tennessee has approved it. So you'll see that she's more involved than we would think, and that kind of complicates the narrative. A little bit on how cotton was processed and some very uh, local primary documents. I'm going to jump back to my coastal map and I'll close this side piece. You'll notice at the bottom, you've got a summary of the coast, you've got statistical data, and there's quite a few of these that are pulled from scholarly works. So your students can actually do some statistical analysis that helps them better understand populations of free people of color and enslaved people in contrast to the number of uh, working class whites or wealthy whites to understand the dynamic and why there may have been tension um, in these communities, but also the number of goods that are coming out of these plantations. And so we offer a very robust exploration of an actual plantation. And if you click on the plantation button in the middle of the bottom right series of circles, you get to go into a plantation and look at the different ways that plantations um, were structured in terms of their economy. So we talk about the kinds of agricultural sciences, how they shipped goods, what it was like to work in fields, the actual economics of field work, and then how they refined goods. If you're thinking about field work, you may have remembered that we included a section earlier on the difference between rural slavery and urban slavery. That is a more cultural aspect, whereas this would be a more economic aspect. And so if you click any one of these galleries, you also note that these are very, very aesthetically pleasing um, primary sources that we painstakingly researched. So we've got, you know, very, very uh, design-oriented images everywhere. 
breakdowns of how this work would have occurred, ways of reflecting on this type of work, and then each of these four sections will have an, a gallery attached to it for primary sources. So at least four images of localized primary sources with captions. And remember, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, wow, this is a lot of stuff, in your teacher materials section, in your support materials, we included document analysis guides for photographs, um, for letters, and we've also included a section by section breakdown with simple ways that you can have students or participants analyze these documents and reflect back upon them. I'll just look at a couple of these different images. So all of these would have been Savannah, somewhere between Savannah and Charleston. Um, some go as far as the Civil War, but most of them are 1840s, 1850s. And so what's interesting here is you get to see not only cotton, but some of these you get to see rice or indigo as well. I'll close this gallery. I'll close a couple of these galleries. Mike, as you're going deep into the resource, I think people are, are just really uh, impressed with the amount of content. And one of the questions is, how long did it take to develop and launch the project? And who funded it? That's fantastic. Great question. So it took us about a year. Um, so six months of research. Uh, the filming was, went pretty quickly. We, uh, we filmed maybe over a week or a weekend. And then it took about another six months to build. Um, the funding came through the Imlay Foundation, I-M-L-A-Y, and they not only funded the building of this, but the complementary piece, the virtual reality piece that works with the Oculus Go, which is still in production right now. Um, of course, if you're in the museum field, I have to give a big shout out to Telfair Museums who gave us really unrestricted access to their archives, to their spaces. So to be able to do this, we think we're, this is kind of ahead of the curve in terms of making house museums more available. Um, I'm gonna hit the back button here and come out. And so I really have to, I can't talk enough about Telfair Museums and how they partnered with us, especially um, uh, Shannon Browning Mullis, the director of the Owens Thomas House. She worked very, very closely with us to give us this kind of access. So we're back at our coastal exploration. I'm gonna close this window as well. Tracy, please feel free, yes, we have more questions. Please feel free to ask questions if you have them. And we I'll come have back. Questions, Mike, they go back to the, the narrative though, and I didn't want to, if you're in the middle of navigating. If you no, that's to. fine. Okay. So um, some of the questions about that, just uh, how to narrate and discuss you know, the, the content was uh, have you had African-American visitors that you're aware of to the Owens Thomas House and how have they responded to the museum and also to our, um, our tour specifically, our virtual learning journey itself like and, and descendants as well? Absolutely. So um, if you do a little bit of research on your own about house museums and sort of this change in narrative, you'll start to see a handful of um, places pop up one of them is the Owens Thomas House. It will come up consistently. There's also a plantation in Louisiana, I think it's called the Whitney, that is doing, that, that is sort of changing its narrative as well. Um, what we're finding is that these areas are getting an enormous response from the African American community of no longer hiding what has happened here, also being honest about what has happened here, but also offering the voices of people who up to this point have been in the shadows. They're really proud of the work that's been done. Um, the Owens Thomas House in Slave Quarters is lauded consistently for a bold approach. Um, we personally haven't heard back yet because we just launched this in the fall. We're hoping we'll see something similar. As word gets out, we're able to do more conferences like the National Council for Public History, Georgia Association of Historians, uh, Georgia Association of Historians. Um, personally, we haven't heard back but Owens Thomas House and places similar have a very, very glowing response from the African-American community. I hope that sort of addresses that, that question. Um, I'm gonna move to our last section. So we went to the house, sort of the, the first area. We zoomed out to the coast 
and now we'll go back into the city. You'll notice in the city that you have several different sections. You can literally look point by point at the city. You can see the people who live there, and then you can look at the legal system and the differences between the types of slavery there. So I'm gonna go back to my city. Let me open and make sure. I want, excuse me, economics of the house. Okay, that, that's my right section. So we usually start with showing them this page, the economics of the city, to show them the different kinds of people that would have lived here. Because when you get into a city, cities are messy, complicated places where people are interacting. So we do a general breakdown. Of course, these aren't all of the people who would have lived here. But we want to say these are some of the major groups of people that would have interacted on a daily basis. And I, I, I was personally, as a historian, I find free people of color very fascinating because of the sort of in-between nature of their lives. They're not enslaved. They're somewhat free, but they're restricted. Um, and if you click any of these groups, you'll get a closer look, a piece to reflect on, um, fantastic primary documents that are localized. So this would be a drayman who would have made some money moving goods around. So he would have had some historical jargon, some agency over his own life. And then you can explore more about these types of individuals through a gallery. So you'll notice a similarity here that like when we were in the plantation, we had different, um, different areas of economics of a plantation. Each one had a gallery. Similar here, each different group has its own gallery. Um, something I, I have to note that we're really happy about, the stereograph borders. We tried as hard as possible to be immersive. And so anytime you pull up a gallery, it will be made to look as though you're looking at a stereograph image from the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. And then you can go really deep into these individuals. You'll notice, or you may have been noticing, that these captions are rather large. We know that some students, if you tried to show this maybe to an eighth grade audience, this might be a little much. We did try to make sure that the Lexile level, a little bit of education jargon there, the Lexile level tops out at about 1,200. Most of them are at 10 to 1,100. Um, so maybe a little bit more high school. But all of this went through several rounds of editing. So we started writing. Shannon Browning Mullis at the Owens Thomas House did another proofreading round of scholarly editing. And your very own Tracy Wiley did a third round of editing. So we have a very scholarly um, text and a very in-depth look as you go through, not just pictures, but essentially um, scholarly writing that backs everything up. I'm gonna close this gallery and I'll head back to um, all the different groups and I'll close this gallery. We tried to make intuitive what to close and what not to. So you can explore all the different groups, right? We tried to tell you, hey, you can click here. I'm gonna open my table of contents. So we were looking at economics of the house and city, but now if I wanna get into the nitty gritty, I'll go to life and labor. So there's like, just like there are two areas of the grounds, the house and the slave quarters, there's two areas of the city, the life and the economics. So now we're gonna look at the life. This is built on an interactive map that the Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters graciously turned over to us. We converted it into a digital experience and you can literally follow Mr. Richardson, the first owner of the house, Mr. Owens, the third owner of the house, throughout the city, but also you can see how public squares, roads, um, how everything in the city was essentially tethered to slavery was a part of the enslavement of individuals. This may take a second to load and I'll make sure that you understand all the buttons that are available. I know that we are coming close to time. The good news is this is our final section. And so as we poke around this section, I'll start to convert to sort of the teaching aspect and make sure you understand all the teaching materials. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we uh, broke this down and how you can go about teaching. So you'll but, notice you have several different colored buttons. Go ahead. It's a great time to jump in with a question that we just got. Um, Absolutely. Mentioning that it'd be easy to spend an entire day going through all of this, and, but we teachers generally have between 45 minutes or less to an hour with students. 
and are the teacher guides set for a more streamlined visit? So as you're talking Absolutely. about- Absolutely. No questions asked. The teacher guides basically jigsaw everything so that if you wanted to look at the house, kind of the big first section, we would jigsaw the house into groups and every group would get a different room. So students would explore one room. They would briefly analyze that room, do something that we call a six word story. So they would do a six word summary of it. They'd look at the VR, they'd talk about how that makes them feel, and then they'd, then they'd switch with other groups and each group would explain their room and then you would move on. We'd also offer a real quick uh, differential. What's it like in the slave quarters versus what's the experience like in the house? And then you would move to the next section. So the guides will tell you how to move quickly, but get a robust experience. We're very well aware that your time is limited and absolutely precious. And I'll, I'll show those right at the end. Um, please, Tracy, feel free to jump in with more questions like that. So each pin will tell you more about literally how slavery played out, literally section by section of the city. So if you wanna go really deep, and some of these even have photos, so some have really beautiful pictures that go with them. If you're a Savannah native, that building may look familiar to you. That's a, I believe that's part of the SCAD college currently. Um, and here we get into the idea of secret schools, um, how, how people were jailed, quote unquote, for safekeeping. When the Owens family went out of town, they jailed their nursemaid. The enslaved nursemaid, Emma, who was beloved and brought to Philadelphia to have her ailments uh, looked at by a, a, an expensive doctor, was also jailed when they went out of town. And we point that out here. I'll move to a different color. In a different color. In a different color. So you can see how Mr. Richardson would have experienced the city point by point and how Mr. Owens would have experienced the city. An interesting part about Mr. Owens, um, yes, he owned many plantations. He was also in Congress. He was also mayor of Savannah. And one of his big uh, to-dos in Congress, although he didn't really participate in much legislation, he did uh, promote the gag rule, which if you're familiar with history, essentially said we can't bring to the floor any discussion of slavery or its limitation. That seems consistent with his beliefs. Um, so you have all these different buttons and ways of exploring, but also you'll notice that these little scrolls that pop up so you can look more deeply into other sections. Laurel Grove, a cemetery where free and enslaved people were buried. We explored that, but also um, we went into sort of, this is the part where we sort of shy away if folks are, if this is a little too much, we talk about the reality of slavery, that slavery was a business. And we have a photo gallery of the actual business of people being sold. That usually is the place where some people say that may be too far. We tried to be very honest about what was going on here. So if that's something you don't want to explore, we absolutely understand. Other buttons you have available, you have more data if you want to look at it on the nature of the city itself. And we have lessons on how to look at that data. And then if I go back, we can look deeply into the legal system. And this is actually Mr. Owen's reinterpreted bookcase. A shout out to our designer, Daniel who did a wonderful job here. And we pulled several of the books from his bookcase and we brought in primary source laws that you can explore. It should tell us that we can look at these laws. Yes, and so each book is actually a law from the period. We cited the law so that you could go back and look at the actual code itself, which are all publicly available but then we kind of explained what, uh, what this law means and what effect it had on the system of slavery. And we tried to be um, sort of uh, all encompassing. So there's things on selling produce in the market, trying to teach enslaved people to vote or excuse me, to read or write, uh, how they're able to move through the city and things like that. So I'll just kind of refresh. You have your exploration of the entire house and slave quarters. You have an exploration of the coast and the plantations therein. You have an exploration of the city and how the city experienced slavery. Remember, you can always take a walking tour. So if I go up to my main navigation, this was the little tour person. 
I'll show you this tour and then I'll talk about the educational aspects. I'll give a pause for questions as we sort of wrap up. Here's your little tour guy. This is the Matterport camera. Some, some people just like to turn their students loose on this. Um, you can literally guide yourself through the experience if you want to. And you'll see little hot spots below you. And I can look wherever I want to go. I can go into these places. You'll see these little circles. That shows you that's the direction you can move. But you can look wherever you want. And I'll go into the downstairs, downstairs portion of the slave quarters. Should move me forward. And now I can look around. Uh, fun fact, this is believed to be the largest example of haint still existing. And so this is a self-guided tour. There will be hot spots that'll talk more. This should mirror what you'll see in the general experience, but you'll get cool pictures and other things of that nature. So some students just like to do this. Other students want the actual guided tour. So you have both options available to you. I'm gonna pop back into the experience. That is what your little tour guide is. So I hope you feel a little comfortable looking at this. Yes, it is robust. I'm gonna hit the exit button and jump out. That would take you back to our launch page. If I went to our original page, you would see your support materials. And for educators or museum professionals who are interested in how could I go about this point by point, we did provide primary documents and these are in your Nearpod. You can look at some direct letters that were written that offer a complicated idea of the relationship between the wealthy people who enslaved their servants and the nature of those who were enslaved there. And we offer um, document analysis guides on those. But also for each major section, we offer you a very specific breakdown, standards-based with essential questions, how to go through these experiences, and then literally what to show students, little sections of the video, and then ask them to answer this question, explain this. So very, very specific breakdowns. If I jump back to my Nearpod, You'll see records like, moving a little quickly, but I wanna show you one more piece here. You'll see questions like this. How did the wealthy inhabitants use this room versus how did the enslaved inhabitants experience this room? Think, pair up with someone, and then share that with your neighbor. So simple lessons, but then if you wanna do a bigger exploration, if I'm back at my involved lesson plans, you can go much more deeply. We think it's an easy way if you're doing a tour, sort of a virtual tour, like you're an interpreter, you could ask these questions of a group. If you're with students, you can literally have them jigsaw a piece of paper and explain all the different rooms after only viewing one room. So you have really involved lesson plans that make it very simple to do a streamlined exploration or something much more in depth. We think this works in a classroom. We also think that this would work in a um, sort of virtual museum setting. I'm going to kind of pause here and ask if there are any questions. I'll sort of wrap up here and say, remember that we have your experience you can launch broken down into three sections, your support materials, and on your agenda, you have all of these links. Let me go all the way back to the beginning. Feel free to ask any questions. Tracy, feel free to break in if you want to but I'll pull up your agenda it. and make sure that that makes sense. Break it. Absolutely. So there was a, a question towards the beginning, but it was, it was a tangent, so I waited till the end here. And that Quite all right. is, have you had, are you aware of any conversations or have you had conversations about applying these, top, these types of evolving teaching methods to Southern Confederate monuments? Um, That's a great question. I am a very, I'm very interested in that. Um, for that individual specifically, if you want to send me an email, here's my email. I have a lot more research on that. That's something I'm very fascinated with. Whenever I teach 
reconstruction and civil war history. I sort of teach that way. I think there are people who are doing a great job at that. Um, there is a site called Bunk History, which is a quote from Henry Ford, history is bunk. Um, and there are some great historians like David Blight from, David Blight from Yale is doing some of that research. Uh, if you want to email me at mkenlin, uh, I'd be happy to talk more about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about your agenda to, just to make sure it's clear. Feel free if you want to go, you can go. If you want to stay, I'm happy to sit and take more questions. Here's our general introduction so that people understand what's available in the house, the brief history, your link to our experience. If you want to actually look at the Owens Thomas House site itself from Telfair Museum, here's their site. We talk about that approach, why we think their approach is unique, why we like it. We talk about that language of that new progressive language of history. That's the sensitivity. Here is a complementary curriculum, teaching hard history we talked about earlier. This is their re reinterpreted history that goes along with this sensitivity and new approach. Here is their podcast series I mentioned. Here's the breakdown we just went through. And when we talk about teaching strategies, here's a link to all your support materials, other virtual field trips that we do. In your support materials, you'll also find links to, if I go to my educator overview, you will also find more links to other progressive materials that we think are doing a great job with this narrative. And here are links there. Um, C3 inquiries, slavery in the making of modern America. So we have Henry Louis Gates Jr., PBS, and the Southern Poverty Law Center. Tracy, can I answer some more questions?